Welcome back to Big Mouth and welcome to yet another Big Mouth Daily. Remember, you can tag, follow me and chat to me over on Twitter at Movies TV Mad. On today's Big Mouth Daily, I will be breaking some, well, some gossip, some tittle tattle. So before we start that Wonder Woman free conversation, I want to be clear, I'm working off sources and rumours and things like that. So we're not talking about facts, but it's very, very exciting for me personally, if it's true. It could absolutely piss some people off, but we're going to go with it anyway. After that conversation, I'm going to explain to you why Batman Begins, in my opinion, not a universal truth, but my truth, is the best comic book movie of all time. And I'll explain to you why. And then we'll be answering some questions from superfan Scott Edwards about Smallville. And it's awesome that he's getting into the show and he's loving it. And if you've never seen the Superman prequel story Smallville that ran firstly on the WB, then from season five to season 10 on the CW, it's a prequel story. You should get into it. But right now, let's get on with the big headline that Warner Brothers do not want Patty Jenkins to write or direct Wonder Woman 3. Now, let's go back to before um, the release of Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cup, when Grace Randolph surprised all of us, as she always does, random lady that she is, that some executives at Warner Media want Zack Snyder, or wanted Zack Snyder then, to direct Wonder Woman 3. Now, let's go back in time further to the release of Wonder Woman 84. Now, the, res the original response from critics before a lot of you saw it, of course, I saw Wonder Woman 84 prior to critics reacting to it, but the response was the right movie at the right time. It was supposed, to, we were told it was this inspirational, feel-good movie, and certainly that monologue in the end by Diana was very inspirational, but a great monologue doesn't repair the damage of the, the previous two, um, two acts, does it? A great third act, for sure, but the first two acts were nothing less than boring. So, the reaction from the critics was somewhat positive. It was a muted response. They found something positive to say. It was like they wanted to be positive rather than negative. And they was. They were trying to, everyone was trying to bump up people going to movie theatres. Of course, this was the first movie um, that broke the release window as far as, as far as Warner Media were concerned. So we wanted to get people back into movie theatres quite right too. Um, so it was only when everybody went to see the film that we got the response. And the response was that this film had more plot holes than Delilah's Bucket. Now, when I reacted to this film, I was positive about it myself. Now, I didn't want to go on a negative kind of tangent before anyone had seen it, because I know I'm not an influencer. I'm not a big deal. I'm, I'm not a successful YouTuber, but negative kind of tone from me could lead to negativity elsewhere, and I didn't want to get the blame for that. So I was as positive as I could be about the film. But I had the same emotions and feelings as most people. So people started tearing this movie apart. Don't forget, this film was originally verified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. I don't know where it is now. Is it rotten? It's not doing so well as it was. As soon as the public went to see it, things changed very quickly, as well as official critics who were left to review the movie weren't giving it a high number. So... What were, the, what were the plot holes in this movie? Now, there's this crystal. They make a wish and they get their dreams to come true. So Diana wishes for the return of Steve Trevor. So he appears. Basically, he is inside another man's body. No, not like that, you dirty bastards. But so basically, it's the whole quantum leap thing. He looks in the mirror and he knows what he looks like. But basically, this is the premise of Steve Trevor returning. So they actually have sex. So a lot of unkind people tried to say that she was having, um, Diana was having sex with a man who didn't give his permission. And they were going a bit more crude than that. 
So that was plot hole number one. There was no need to bring Steve back like this. And so that was the that was problem number one. People didn't particularly warm to Christine Wiig's performance as Cheetah. Um, the CGI for Cheetah, look, listen to me. That isn't what Cheetah looks like in the comics. Nothing like, you know, Jenkins went down another route and it didn't work because she's not a comic book fan. That's the truth of the matter. She's a fan of the Wonder Woman TV series and the Wonder Woman TV series is completely different to the comic books. I was really excited initially that we were getting Cheetah. This is one of Wonder Woman's top villains. And, you know, in some iterations, they have been friends, as they was in this movie. But when I looked at that friendship, it was rushed. And I feel, as many people do, that friendship should have been an existing friendship before the movie started. So it had longevity. So when they become enemies, it's more compelling. If we look at the Smallville thing, Clark and Lex being friends for three or four or five seasons of Smallville, then slowly going down the enemy route really worked for the show. It made it more powerful. So all of a sudden they're supposed to be friends, but they've only known each other for like a few days or weeks or whatever. It doesn't make sense. The first two acts of the movie are as dull as dishwater. There's a lot of conversations. The pacing's very slow. Look, it's not a terrible film by any means, but it's not in the standards of the first movie. And so what happened very quickly, there was a lot of negativity about this film, but Toby Emmerich and Warner Brothers Pictures came out immediately and greenlit a Wonder Woman 3, and they told us that Patty Jenkins and Gal Gadot would return. Here's the thing, Gal Gadot, Gal Gadot, not Gadot, Gal Gadot and Patty Jenkins didn't confirm anything via their social media. You'll say, well, is that, is that odd, Mick? Yes, it's out of character for both of them. And normally when something goes down, they're quick to go on their social media. Um, their habits have been the same from the beginnings of their careers. So it was already very odd. So what were Warner Brothers and Warner Media up to here? Were they lying? Well, I think they were being economical with the truth. But why? But, well, they were already concerned that the viewerships on HBO Max, the launch of the film was very strong, very high on HBO Max. But as soon as people watched the movie, there was no repeat repeat viewings or as many repeat, repeat repeat viewings as they wanted. There was no buzz on social media. The buzz was negative and people weren't going back to theatres to watch it. This hurt the movie's bottom line. And basically, listen, Warner Brothers Pictures and Warner Media had warned Patty on repeated occasions not to do the mouse scene. And they, they gave her an ultimatum, the mouse scene or the Fimiscira scene. Personally, the Fimiscira scene is one of the strongest parts of the movie. So I don't know why they were asking her to remove that. But I think their, their concerns about the Fimiscira sequence is that it didn't need to be there because basically nothing in terms of the film. Yes, they've got this arc. They've got this commentary about you shouldn't be selfish. You shouldn't cheat. And obviously that has a big say in the end of the movie. So I understand why that scene's there. And it's a great, stunning scene. And I like it. But the mouse scene is despicable. The mouse scene, I mean, I can't, I, it's, it's just astonishing to me that the person who directed Wonder Woman 2017 gave us that. And you know my opinions of Wonder Woman 2017. I think Wonder Woman 2017 is more of a Zack Snyder story and a Zack Snyder film more than a Patty Jenkins film. I think Patty got in a lot of arguments with Zack and the studio at the time. She wasn't happy with the darker elements, Wonder Woman having the shield, having the sword. And we already know this because she took the shield and the sword from her in Wonder Woman 84. So this film lacked a lot of action. It had one good scene in um, the road, the long road or whatever, whatever that scene is. That was okay. There wasn't many jewels. The fighting between, um, what's her bloody name? I forgot it, even though I've already mentioned it. Um, yeah, the fighting between Cheetah and Wonder Woman wasn't great either. Um, it just didn't work. Now, um, I think that Maxwell Lord did work to a point. I mean, look, they were trying to create this toxic male character and they were trying to show greed and things like that. It kind of worked, right? Uh, it was a great performance. It was a great character to a point. I think the villain actually works and his love for his son was an endearing part 
of his character. But there was another plot hole. When all this was over, he just runs to his son. No police, no arrests. He was responsible for many, many deaths, even though he wasn't really in his right mind. You know, he should have at least been arrested. There could have been an explanation why he didn't go to jail in the next movie. So there's lots of plot holes in this movie. Terrible pacing. A horrible mousing which shows old men looking at women doing aerobics in aerobics costumes. A bunch of old men looking at them as they bend over. So it really it had many, many problems. And it wasn't the greatest movie. Uh, you, you know, you wouldn't think that this is the sequel to 2017's Wonder Woman. Now, Jenkins already tried to softly nudge at us that this wasn't a direct sequel. Of course, it kind of was. It was a direct sequel because Steve Trevor was dead. He comes back to life. That's a sequel. That's a continuation, right? So I don't know what basically what she was trying to say. It doesn't continue from all the stuff that happened in that film. So when I when I first heard they were they were going to be in '84. I thought it was an interesting choice with with problems to that. I thought it was too far away from the original movie. And I think this is this is something we can see. She wanted to get away from Wonder Woman 2017. She wanted to get away from 1918. I think that's the year the first one set in because that wasn't her movie. Another problem was she started coming out criticizing the studio. But Zack Snyder was involved heavily involved with the narrative of Wonder Woman 2017 because he co-wrote the picture. He wanted to do something even darker from beyond that time as well. We know that already. That was revealed by Zack. Zack revealed a picture. He revealed that picture straight after she was slaughtering what they wanted to do with Wonder Woman 2017. And she said she was resistant to what they were doing with that film. They didn't want, she didn't want Wonder Woman to be as violent as she was. But there are elements in graphic novels in DC comic history where she is a violent gladiator. And for me, that's cool. And Gal really pulls that off. Gal pulls off the compassionate side as well. I think there's got to be a balance. But Patty didn't want a balance, right? So as soon as she started complaining about Wonder Woman 2017, Zach posts his picture. Now, publicly, Zach always says, yeah, she's great. I love her, blah, blah, blah. This is what people in Hollywood do. They're bullshitters. Yes, even Zach. We love him, but he's a bullshitter as well. They all are. They didn't get on. They didn't agree with where the movie was going. I think she got certain things her way in Wonder Woman 2017, but mostly that film is Zack Snyder's, the way it looks, the way it feels. It's a, look, it's one of my favorite CBMs of all time. It's a sensational movie, and she directed it. But without Zack, that movie wouldn't have been as awesome and epic as it was. Zack goes away. Uh, Patty Jenkins and Jeff Johns write the movie. And no surprise, it's a lighter movie. It's, it's more about Wonder Woman's heart. Now, I don't mind that. I don't mind that element. But you wasted two acts of a movie, right? So I can tell you that what I've been told is that Warner Brothers are scared shitless about allowing Patty Jenkins to write and direct Wonder Woman 3. Now, there is elements that the studio, as Grace Randolph told us months ago, that they want Zack Snyder to take over that movie. Now, what they want to do is to appease us, the fans, and give Zack something. And because um, there's a lot of ambiguity about Wonder Woman 84... And listen, the studio wasn't happy. Patty herself told us they were telling her not to do stuff. They forewarned her about the things she was doing and she did not listen. And it ended in tears. That's the fact. So they do not want her doing Wonder Woman free. They want Zach to do it. Now, I reacted to Grace Randolph saying that elements of Warner Media want him to do Wonder Woman free a while back. And it would seem that Warner Media, Jason Keeler, People like that maybe want him to do that film rather than Warner Brothers Pictures. But maybe Warner Brothers Pictures are on for that as well. Because I think at this stage they're thinking anything's better than Wonder Woman 84. And so it is a problem and it's something they're thinking about. And as I say, the reason that they greenlit the third one with Patty and Gal signed up straight away was because they needed something to show that they, they were giving, they, they needed consumer confidence. When people started to see this movie, consumer confidence wasn't there. 
This was the whole problem with it. And so people have said to me, yeah, but Zach wouldn't do that to Patty. You'll be very surprised. You've, if you've never been to Hollywood before, you don't understand. I'd do it to Patty. If I was Zach, I'd take that movie. Zach cares about these DC characters. Zach cares about Wonder Woman. He's so passionate about that character. And we all are, especially Gal. And I don't think, and people can say, well, Gal wouldn't do it. Yeah, believe you me, Gal would be more than willing to work with Zack Snyder on Wonder Woman 3. There needs to be a course correction. There can be no more mistakes with the DCEU. Once Flashpoint happens, it's got to work. The fans and the studio have got to be on board. It's very important. So the Flashpoint movie is very important. And the next Wonder Woman movie is extremely important. Is this the conclusion to her story or is there going to be more? Now, as far as Patty Jenkins is concerned, this is the end of a trilogy. This is a trilogy, right? Now, there's I, I would assume there's people at Warner Brothers Pictures who are saying, just let her do a third and final movie, move on and bring another director on to continue a next chapter in the evolution of Wonder Woman. Now, I suppose you can see the logic in that, but I think there's other elements at Warner Media who are saying, let's, 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 sorry, I'm saying let's a lot, aren't I? Let's course correct what's already happened. Because they're going on a new direction. People love Zack Snyder's Justice League. Now, what we have to understand is there's a reason they want Zack to do this, because there is a call for him to return, but maybe they don't want to restore the Snyderverse as a whole, but there could be a compromise where Flashpoint, if he does this movie, doesn't burn down the Snyderverse. They will find a compromise where Zack does the odd movie. Maybe, as I, when I reacted to what Grace Randolph said, maybe he'll be in charge of Wonder Woman and take over that. And as I again said at the time, you know, nothing dramatic is going to be announced. I would think they're just going to say she's too busy with a new Star Wars movie, Cleopatra, and she can't do it. A good mate, Zack Snyder, is going to take over. Easy. Listen, Wonder Woman 84 didn't work. I don't, you know what? It's interesting because when I go on to TikTok, and you can follow me on TikTok. I'm Big Mouth. You'll find me there somewhere having a laugh and talking about movies and dancing in my shorts without a top on if you want to see me make a twat of myself. But it's interesting with TikTok. When films come on, we've had a lot of Falcon and the Winter Soldier on there. We've had a WandaVision, so much WandaVision. And we had a lot of Zack Snyder's Justice League. But do you know what we haven't had a lot of on TikTok? Even when it was released, Wonder Woman 84. That tells you a story, everyone. The film didn't hit. It didn't work. And because we had a pandemic, they got away with a low box office. And because they don't really reveal the full numbers and they've given us an extent of the numbers on HBO Max, they get away with it. I'm quite sure that movie was a flop and didn't have a lot of repeat viewings. Repeat viewings are the most important thing in viewerships, in people going to the movie theatre. If people don't go back and watch these movies, they don't make the big, big money. Avengers Endgame wouldn't be, well, now the second most successful box office movie of all time if people didn't go back to watch it. Same with Infinity War, same with Star Wars, The Force Awakens, and with every big movie, right? You don't want the audience just to go and see it once and say, that was all right. You want them to be so excited they need to see it again and again and again, like I did with Man of Steel, with, like many of us did with Man of Steel, right? It wasn't the biggest box office hit in the world, but people went back. A lot of people loved that movie and still love that movie today. And it's the same with BVS, even though it wasn't the big, big hit that WB wanted, people like us who love it, Snyder stands, still, I mean, we've all ordered, haven't we, the new um, remastered edition of Batman vs Superman. So Wonder Woman 84 wasn't the hit that they wanted it to make. Now let's forget what wanted it to be. Now let's forget, right? Let's forget about what my sources are telling me Let's forget what Grace Randolph told us a few months ago, just before the release of Zack Snyder's Justice League Snyder Cut. This is my opinion. I do not believe there is any way that Patty Jenkins will direct or write Wonder Woman 3. And I'm sorry if that upsets you. 
I believe Zack Snyder will take this movie over. And if he doesn't, somebody else will. Now, it would... Now, this is when we talk about somebody else. It's the norm now in Hollywood for a woman to direct a woman. So it would be out of character right now for studios. But they've got another problem. Yesterday, uh, the Restore the Snyderverse had another event on Twitter and on all platforms of social media. And I think it reached just under 500 million K tweets or trends or however it works. I don't know how it all works. You can explain to me in the comments down below. So, the Restore the Snyderverse movement isn't going anywhere. So they have to satisfy our fandom that doesn't stop exposing them and going on about their mistakes. They need to do something. They, need, they want us to see that they respect Zack and they're giving him something. And Wonder Woman 3 and, and the Wonder Woman universe would be perfect for Zack. But it doesn't mean we're restoring the Snyderverse at this moment. It doesn't mean we get... Justice League 2 and 3, but it would be a star. And I believe, as I've already said, this is part of one of some kind of compromise from WB and Warner Media to give Zack something. And if they were happy with Patty, if Wonder Woman 84 hit big, this wouldn't be the project Zack was working on. But it's beneficial to both parties because simply whether you love Patty Jenkins or not, whether you... Uh, liked Wonder Woman 84 or not, we can't have films being just all right. The DCEU is not in that position, right? I've seen James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. I think it's a brilliant movie that everyone's going to love. That's what we need. Movies that make people happy and to go back and see them again and again. So it's not good enough that Wonder Woman 84 had a great monologue by the, the lead hero at the end, right? What we saw was Patty Jenkins' real mentality in that film. And that mentality stunk. As I say, it's not a bad movie. It's an okay movie. But Wonder Woman, Batman and Superman, all these DC characters must be in the best movies ever. They must excite mostly everyone. Is that an unfair expectation? Of course it is. But this is where we are today. And the DCEU is sadly... So behind the MCU, the most successful franchise of all time. And that cannot be allowed to happen because the DC characters are so accessible. In the comics, they're even more accessible than Marvel characters. As a DC stan, that's what I'm saying. Um, a lot of people may not agree with me with that, but that's what I'm saying. So I do believe that someone, even if it's not Zack Snyder, will take over Wonder Woman 3. Preferably, I'd like it to be Zack. And so we will see what happens there. But I do believe this rumour and I do believe that Patty Jenkins will not do the next movie. I need you to help me out, please. While I had this video on pause, my girlfriend came in and said, I look like an idiot in this hat and it doesn't work for the video. It's better off if I don't wear it. So comment down below. Do you prefer me with the hat or without the hat? And if you take my side, I can prove her wrong. And you know how brilliant it is to prove women wrong? Because they never think they're wrong. Right, let's get on with the video. So, I want to tell you and explain to you why I feel Batman Begins is the best comic book movie of all time. And I know I've said to you before, I hate this either or and the best thing this and the best thing that. But that's the era we live in. And I was examining this. And how I examined it is, how did I feel after each of... Of all the CBMs I've ever seen, had finished once the credits had rolled. And I felt that my satisfaction levels were at the highest after Batman Begins. Now, this was considering that after I first saw Superman the movie as a kid, my satisfaction level was so high. Now, I'm an older guy, so when I rewatched it, I still love it, but my satisfaction for it isn't so high. There's some things I kind of get bored with because it's kind of dated now, but I still love that movie. Man of Steel, I absolutely love. Batman vs. Superman, Wonder Woman 2017 is one where my satisfaction level is probably nearly equal with Batman Begins. And of course, there's all the Marvel movies, which I think are great, but still my satisfaction levels are not as high as they are 
with Batman Begins. So there's a loads of great CBMs, even the middling ones or the ones people say are crap. I still get a level of um, of enjoyment for them. But I'm going to explain to you why Batman Begins is my favourite comic book movie of all time. Considering Superman is my favourite character and Batman's always been my second favourite character, that's a surprise to me. But I've always loved Batman ever since I was introduced to the 1960s series. So, Batman Begins is made like an independent movie. Now, of course, uh, Christopher Nolan is a former independent movie director, and it was staggering that Warner Brothers allowed him to do it. But he'd already started working with them anyway. He'd already made some amazing films. The man's a genius. There's no question about that. He is the master filmmaker, right? But this is a brilliant film because when we first meet Bruce Wayne, he's he's broken. He's still twisted up as, as an adult, as a man, from witnessing the death of his parents. And what I love about this film, the character evolution is beautiful. We go from this broken guy who wants revenge because we get a lot of flashbacks in, in, the, in, these, in this movie as well, which I think is great. Uh, and so you really get to not only get to know Bruce. What this is what I love about this film: you get more Bruce Wayne than Batman. And I know a lot of people say, "What would you want more Bruce Wayne than Batman?" No, that's not what I'm saying. When you've got someone like Christian Bale, you need the audience to see his performance. Christian is so good. And out of all the Dark Knight movies, all three of the Dark Knight movies, this is his best performance because he was given more meat on the stick. And it was amazing. So I really, I really, I felt like I got to know Bruce Wayne after this movie. And I liked what I got to know. And it, it's Bale. Bale is just amazing in this movie. And I also love the fact that we get to know kind of the supporting characters like Alfred, like Rachel Gould. And, you know, Rachel and, you know, all these characters and, and the guy Rutger Hauer plays in, in, you know, Wayne Enterprises, right? There's a great supporting cast of characters. Let's be honest, there's a great supporting cast. And most of these people are indie movie actors as well. So it was amazing. It, it really was. And um, we, got, we, we, we had a version of the Scarecrow in this movie as well. And what a performance that was. So everything about this movie really works. But the thing that has to work, that did work, is Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne. He is so good in this movie. And I believe in this hero and in this character, in this character, in this movie, because of Christian Bale's performance. You are following this character from the very beginning. I love the way he's kind of researching the criminal fraternity. And he becomes a criminal. And that moment when he's actually stealing from Wayne Enterprises, right? You know, and he goes, um, he says something to the Asian copper and he goes, tell that to the bloke who owns that. And it's ironic because he does own it. So I love that. I just think it's such a good movie. I also love the element of the tumbler. The tumbler is just a great idea. Nolan originally didn't want a Batmobile. And basically the studio rightly said, you have to have a fucking Batmobile, mate. You know, the fans will expect it. We want to sell the bloody toys, you know. We're in a business here. So anyway, he didn't want to have the old-fashioned Batmobile. By the way, Snyder showed that the old-fashioned Batmobile is the fucking best, right? But creating the Tumblr, so it was a compromise. He gave us the Tumblr as the new Batmobile, if you like. And I think it's great. I love the Tumblr. The Tumblr really works for me. And I think it works the best in the first movie. I love it. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So. What you get here is a film full of energy. It's really like watching Taxi Driver or Joker. It's this onion peeling throughout the whole film, getting to know Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne. And it's Batman Begins. And I just love the kind of logic behind Batman, the fact that he's got the tumbler, the way he goes down to the Bat Cave, and at first it's full of bats and he's a bit scared of bats, and he sorts the cave out, and it becomes the Bat Cave. I think it's awesome. All the elements make logical sense. So Nolan and Goya, who I love a lot as a team, as I've already you know oozed over their script for A Man of Steel, I think they work so well together. And in this film, 
It's the perfect storm. As I say, everything makes sense. The reasons he becomes Batman, how he becomes Batman, even the physics of the costume. Um, when he goes to Morgan Freeman's character and Morgan Freeman's been working on this stuff and it's just like this protective gear. And, you know, he says, I want to go Spelunky or whatever it is, rock climbing. And it all makes sense. So the costume doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from it comes from logical places. It comes from something that's been worked on. And I really like that. I like it when I start talking about, you know, when they need to order more um, bat masks, right? Because uh, that basically they're faulty. I love those little elements. It all makes sense. None of it's far-fetched. Batman can't be far-fetched. Superman can be far-fetched. Wonder Woman can be far-fetched. Even the Flash to a point. But Batman is a living and breathing character. So it's important when you do a film called Batman Begins, it actually works. And I think the choreography for the fighting was amazing. And Nolan loves doing most of his stuff in camera. And I think that's brilliant. And it really works. And obviously for a Batman film, it needs to feel fantastic. The casting of Gary Oldman as the not yet Commissioner Gordon, that is a brilliant performance going through the three movies. But I think he's at his best. I think everyone and everything is at its best in Batman Begins. And Batman Begins is the poorer, younger brother, if you like. Everyone oozes over the Dark Knight. The Dark Knight Rises is like nobody really talks about, do they? It's a really good film, by the way. But unfortunately, Heath Ledger's death changed things for that movie. And that was problematic. But Batman Begins, for me, is I get more enjoyment out of Batman Begins than The Dark Knight. One of my disappointments about The Dark Knight is we see a lot of Batman, but we don't see a lot of Bale without the mask. And as I say, when you've got Bale, you need to see him. You need to see him because he's such a good actor. And he's a face actor. He's an expression actor. You need to be looking in him. You need to be looking deep into his eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. But it just is such... A satisfying, amazing movie on so many levels. And it stood the test of time. It really, I mean, it's a 2005 movie. So you're talking about, we all re surely we're not, hang on. Shit, that's a really old movie now, isn't it? Think about it. To 2005, 2015, right? That's 10 years, right? And then you've got, so that, oh my God. So it's going to be 20 years in 2025. Have I got my maths right? Jesus Christ. That's nuts. We're in 2022 next year. So it's been around for quite a few years, but it is simply amazing. And the music by Hans Zimmer, and I forgot the other guy who did the music with him. It's one of the best, one of the best um, um, musical scores you ever get in a CBM as well. And What's amazing about this film, Nolan was very inspired how Dick Donner made Superman the movie and put some things in it. But he didn't take that literally. I think this is the difference between Christopher Nolan's obsession with Donner and Patty Jenkins' obsession with Donner. She really wants to put, like she did in Wonder Woman 84, this is the problem. She's in the 80s and I think she's in, a, in the 80s because she wants an excuse to copy and paste Donna's work on Superman. And I think this is one of the problems with the movie. You know, we're not there anymore. You know, this is the problem. This is the problem with going to the 80s as well. It's such a well-known era. The 80s is not far gone enough to forget about it so you can get away with stuff. Uh, some of the 80s elements in that film were let them. But Christopher Nolan is also obsessed with Dick Donna's Superman. But what he did... He brought in iconic, legendary actors to support Bale around him, but didn't take it literally. And I think that's important. You've always got to do your own thing. And too many creatives these days are trying to copy and paste people they look up to. Brian Singer tried to do it with Superman Returns. He was obsessed with Donna. Look, look at the mess it got him in. And it's the same with Patty Jenkins. As I've already said, I don't believe she will do Wonder Woman 3. And her obsession, her literal obsession... And copying and pasting that obsession in Wonder Woman 84 could have cost her Wonder Woman 3. So I love how Nolan does that. Nolan, obviously, is an exceptional storyteller. He has got his own ideas. He doesn't want other people's narratives. And I think that's important. So I just thought I'd discuss how much I love Batman Begins. 
And finally today, let's respond to superfan Scott Edwards' Smallville questions. I am about halfway through Smallville Season 2, and the show is amazing. It certainly is, Scott. I was wondering if you could tell me, without spoilers, at what point in the show we really start diving into major Superman and Kryptonian lore. And the point in the show when Clark starts really meeting and interacting with other DC heroes. Right, let's start with this one. So when does he start, um, the show really start diving into major Superman and Kryptonian lore? Well, if you're, where are you? You're in the middle of season two. I am about halfway through. So already, Scott, you should have been introduced to the Kawachi Caves. The Kawachi Caves are, di that are a direct link to Clark's Kryptonian heritage. All those symbols you see, they're Kryptonian. And ultimately, Clark will learn to read them. Then we get near the end of season two. I can tell you, look, I'm, I can't tell you this. I can't talk to you about this stuff without semi-spoiling it. Christopher Reeve will play uh, Professor Virgil Swan, an astronomer who explains to him everything about Krypton. And even he even tells him that the meteor rocks are kryptonite. So he, there's that. And then finally, at the end of the, in the, in the finale, yeah, in the finale, he finally meets Jor-El, who is going to be played by, because you're new to this and this is exciting for you, uh, by Terence Stamp, who will play the voice of Jor-El. And he obviously played General Zod in Superman the movie and Superman 2. And he's brilliant as the character. So you're really going to enjoy that. So already in season two, you will have some Kryptonian heritage and law to deal with. Now, what you're going to find, Scott, is with the Kryptonian heritage and law, it's going to be it's going to be kind of distributed at you as 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 an audience member, like fleetingly. So it's not going to be all at once. So you, you've got some in season two, some in season three, and it goes on and on. So you learn a lot more about Krypton as the seasons progress. But what our Miles likes to do. The creators of Smallville, they like to deal with Clark on the farm, with the Kents, he's dynamic with Lex, he's dynamic with Lionel, Chloe, you know, and Pete and Lana. So they had they had a lot of things to deal with on the show and they did it purposely because when you do that, you don't run out of steam. So that he's dynamic with his friends, he's, you know, this brilliant friendship with Lex that we all know in the end, is going to end in tears. We've got the dynamic, the twisted father-son relationship between Lex and Lionel. That can only end one way. So there's lots of elements. So it's not just about the Kryptonian, uh, the Kryptonian law, but when you get those Kryptonian legacy episodes, they're fantastic. Wait to season nine when you see a scene with General Zod and Jor-El himself. And uh, that's an episode called Candor that you're really going to like. So this show has a lot of Kryptonian lore, my friend. And you should really look forward to it. And as I say, it's spread out throughout the seasons. And it's amazing. So you'll get you'll get a Britain season four. is a big season for Kryptonian lore. As all the characters go on a separate search for these mystical crystals that basically go together. Lex is after them, Lionel's after them, Clark is told to go after them, but he he doesn't want to believe that it's, they're anything to do with him. And Lorna has a big connection to these crystals, but ultimately these crystals are for Clark and they're very important because they hold the knowledge of the galaxy. So you're going to get lots of Kryptonian lore there. And then season five, oh yes, an iconic DC villain in season five. Oh yes, his name begins with a B. Very different from where you've seen him in, how you've seen him in the comics, because it was a TV show. But I think they did him a great service. I I must say. And so that's the Kryptonian law element of it. Now you've also asked me, and the point in the show when Clark starts really meeting and interacting with other DC heroes. Well, this is exciting. Because Clark will meet a lot of DC heroes. Now he meets Perry White in season three in an episode called Perry. He's not like you would imagine Perry White. He's irresponsible. Um, he puts Clark in a lot of trouble. You're going to love that episode. In season four, Clark meets The Flash, but not Barry Allen. He, he meets Bart Allen. 
who, of course, in the comics, I think is the son of Barry Allen or the grandson or whatever. And they're dealing with that in Arrowverse as well right now, very soon. Uh, but yes, Bart Allen, who is Smallville's version of The Flash, we will meet in season four. And is it called The Flash? I forgot. It's not called The Flash. It's called something else. But it's a great episode. And um, basically, Bart Allen in this episode is a thief. But it's going to be great. And in that episode, and it's another spoiler, and I'm sorry, you know that little hint of a race between The Flash and Superman in Justice League? Well, in, the, in this episode of Smallville, Clark Kent... And Bart Allen will actually have a speed race together. And I'm not going to tell you who wins. So that's awesome. In season five, we meet Arf we meet Smallville's version of Arthur Curry. We also meet Smallville's version of Cyborg. So that's very exciting. And in season six, we finally meet Smallville's version of Green Arrow, played by Justin Hartley. Without this version of Green Arrow, you wouldn't have had Arrow. You wouldn't have had a male as Oliver Queen. It's brilliant. He has an extended run in season six, comes back as a full-time character in season eight and gets an episode in season seven. Um, in season seven, we also get an episode, uh, Black Canary. Black Canary appears in Smallville in season seven. That's very awesome as well. And season eight, we, we well, the main villain of season, uh, no, season eight, we get Doomsday. And he's really different. And you're going to enjoy that concept for Doom. So, look, there's a lot of stuff. There's a legion of superheroes. There's there's so many things for you to look forward to, Scott. For me, this is one of the best live-action versions of DC, of Clark Kent, of Superman even. No, I'm not going to talk about if you see him or not in the suit. That's something you can find out for yourself. But listen, for me, Smallville was, was event TV, a must-watch every week. It's great. It's amazing. And what's great about this, considering it's a legacy character from a legacy IP from DC Comics, they found an original way to tell this story. And it's absolutely fantastic. Anyway, I hope that satisfied your hunger to find out more about Smallville, Scott. But that's it for today, sadly. Or maybe that's good news for you lot. Anyway, comment down below. Like, share and subscribe. And I'll be back tomorrow with even more Big Mouth Daily. See you again soon.